Hi. Um, good afternoon by now. Um, before we get started, I would love to know, I can't really see you anymore because they turned off the light. Um, who of you here knows who I am and what Vlamir is? Just raise your hand real quick. Okay, there's still some people that don't know. I did, last year I did a really long 20 minute intro of who I am. Uh, so if you were here last year, you might recognize some of this. Um, but I'll make it shorter, don't worry. So let me get rid of this. This thing is, how does this work? So um, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Dutch independent studio of Lambeer. I uh, do, at Lambeer I do the business and I do the programming. Um, you will mostly recognize me from flying around the world a lot, doing a bunch of interviews and drinking lots of Coca-Cola, which thanks to the organization for making sure I have Coca-Cola. Um, so I do programming and I do business. My uh, colleague is JW. JW does the design. At Vlambeer that means he doodles things into booklets and then makes games about explosions. We made quite a few games about explosions. We're best known for Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, Lift Trousers, Nuclear Throne, Gun Gods, and like 20 other games in the last few years. We uh, started at school. We both went to Game Design University. And uh, at Game Design University, we met each other, didn't like each other, but then decided to work together when we both dropped out of school. Um, we had a little game called Crates from Hell. And Crates from Hell wasn't really a good game, but it had potential. So we decided to continue on it. We dropped out of school. We had instant success. Uh, we had to eat noodles for the first year of our um, life as independent developer. Um, we made sure that I had what I needed to make video games. And um, when we ran out of money, we realized that we had to make a game because the only thing we were good at in life was making video games. Um, so when we needed money, we did the most logical thing. We made a game about fishing with machine guns. Uh, we earned $10,000 with that, and then we spent those $10,000 to turn Craze from Hell into Super Crate Box. Super Crate Box was our first hit game. Um, it was freeware, so we didn't earn any money, but suddenly everybody was looking in our directions. We had a spotlight. We flew to San Francisco for the Game Developers Conference, and uh, at GDC we ate really fancy food, which was nice after eating noodles for so long. We uh, stayed really, really humble. And then we made more video games. Uh, this is a game called Gun Gods. It's a game about hip hop on Venus, which we thought was really logical. Uh, then we started giving more talks. We made more games. This series sent the random encounter. Then we started going to conferences and um, selling t-shirts, which I'm wearing one of the first t-shirts we ever printed, which I always think is cool. Then we decided to make another game about fishing with machine, gun, uh, with machine guns called Ridiculous Fishing. Ridiculous Fishing was going to be an iOS game, and we worked on it for about six months. We got a really cool team together. And then another company in San Francisco decided to steal our idea and release the game. So they stole our idea, made a million dollars or something, and we got really, really depressed. Uh, because if they can just steal our idea and make a lot of money, that's not really fair, is it? Um, so we could either give up or go to the press. We decided to go to the press. This is the New York Times, one of the largest newspapers in the world, reporting on our game getting stolen. And uh, then we decided to make more games. This is Luftrausers, which the talk today is kind of about, um, which is a really angry dogfighting game. And then we released Ridiculous Fishing. Ridiculous Fishing did really well, one game of the year on iOS. And um, after that, uh, Ridiculous Fishing also did well financially. So after that, we had a bit of freedom, and we decided to pursue a game called uh, nuclear throne. So, does everybody know who I am now? Good, wonderful, thank you. Um, so today I want to talk about Luftrausers and very specifically I want to talk about how Luftrausers was developed, uh, the challenges we, we ran into and the challenges of making your very first console game. Uh, when we started on Luftrausers we had never made a game for console. Um, because Luftrausers actually started way earlier than a lot of people think. It was a, it was a very challenging project and I hope um, through this talk to uh, warn you a bit about the things that can happen when you try to make a game for um, consoles. It's not all terrible, but I'll get to that at the end. Uh, for now we're going to talk about the terrible, and there's a lot of terrible, so uh, let's get going. In uh, 2011, we were bored one day. Uh, this was when everything was going super well with Vlambeer. Um, Super Crate Box had just released, 
And um, a friend of ours from Finland was visiting us. Um, his name is Yukio, uh, or most people know him as his DJ name, uh, Kozilek. And um, Kozilek uh, made music. And we decided to make a game with his music. And uh, it turned into an airplane game. And that airplane game was a little flash game. It was called Luftraus Sir, without the S at the end. And um, we made it to sort of detox from a work for hire project that we did. Um, the company that owns Cartoon Network asked us to make a game about dinosaurs. So we worked on a game about dinosaurs for six months or so, and we earned quite some money with that. The problem was that it was not really a great project. We didn't really like it all that much, but you know, this was early on, we needed money, so we took a work for hire contract. So after that was done, we decided to make just a really fun game. Just like two days, just game jam, two days work, release a little flash game. And the flash game that we released ended up being Luftrauser. Now there was something interesting that happened because we decided that if Luftrauser did well, we wanted to continue with it. So in both Luftrausers, uh, in Luftrauser and Dinosaur Zookeeper were analytics. So we checked how well the games were doing. Um, they weren't really like complex analytics, it's just like how often do people start the game? How often do people die? How long do they play? You know, that sort of stuff. And we noticed that the game that we did for Cartoon Network, which had advertisement on national and international TV, actually didn't do as well as Luftrausers. I don't know what that says. Okay. Um, yeah? Okay. Um, Dinosaur Zookeeper, which had commercials on national and international TV, didn't do as well as a little free fl flash game that we released on our website without any marketing. People were just playing it, and then people were talking about it, and they were spreading the game, and way, way more people played our little flash game just because they heard about it, then people played Dinosaur Zookeeper. So, we kept that in mind as we continued work, and in 2012, nothing really happened. Um, the biggest thing that happened is that our game, Ridiculous Fishing, got cloned, and uh, we were really sad about that, so we didn't do anything for the rest of the year. That's basically the whole story. Uh, 2012 wasn't really a very interesting year for us. But, there was something, because in 2012 we made nothing. And we didn't make anything because we were angry. We were angry that our game got stolen. We were depressed that our game got stolen. The only thing my job was in 2012 was whenever the press would come to us asking about ridiculous fishing, would be to say, yes, it is really shitty that our game got stolen and that they made a million dollars. Please don't ask me about this again, because you know, if you have a million dollars stolen from you, you don't want people to ask you about that all day. And that's exactly what the press did, because that was their job. Like, I can't blame them for that. So we were angry. And um, we turned that anger into a lot of press and into a GDC talk. At GDC um, of the next year, we gave a talk about ridiculous fishing being cloned and about how that is not okay. And about... Um, about cloning in general, about how our industry should value creativity and value genuine, sincere work. And the talk went really, really well. Um, and it sort of kick-started us again. So, Ridiculous Fishing and Luftrausers don't really, aren't really separate things. Ridiculous Fishing is the game that got cloned, and Luftrausers is the game that we made because we were angry that we got cloned. Because we're not, we're not really good at communicating a lot of things through many things. What we, know, what we know to do really well is make video games. So if you make a video game when you're really, really angry, you make an angry game. So on the way home from GDC in the airplane, uh, JW didn't have TV because he had a really cheap flight. and. Uh, he had nothing to do, so he opened his laptop and he decided to start working on a new and better version of a Flash game we had made in 2011. Luftrausers, our airplane game, was actually started on an airplane. Because we thought that was topical, I guess. Um, 
And ridiculous fishing, one of the reasons it got cloned and one of the reasons that hurt us so much is because ridiculous fishing, when it was cloned, we had never talked about it. We hadn't mentioned it in the press, we hadn't mentioned it on our website. We wanted to keep it a secret. We wanted to keep it a big secret and then when the game was done, we suddenly announced that we have a new game and everybody would love it. It just meant that when somebody stole it, nobody knew that we were making that game, so they got away with it. So for Lufthraus, we decided to do the opposite. We had nothing yet but we announced the game. The only thing that we made really was this logo. We wrote a really big blog post about what we were up to, we put the logo at the end and we said, that was the announcement, bye. And that was how we announced uh, Lift Trousers. We started working on uh, the design and uh, our design goals. It, um, the interesting thing about the game is that it, it really is a game about super weapons. Um, during, um, during a lot of the um, 20th century, there were a lot of sort of fictional super weapons that were like thought up. A lot of people thought about like satellites with mirrors that would reflect the sun and like scorch entire cities. And those were not, those were not like jokes. These were serious things that intelligence agencies were checking into. And we thought, what if we built the most powerful airplane in the world and we let players use that airplane in dogfighting. So it was, a, it was a game about fantastic airplanes, about airplanes that are so good that they couldn't really exist and they were piloted by the best airplane, airplane pilot in the world um, and it was going to be spectacular. Explosions everywhere, bullets everywhere and you're just weaving through it perfectly, flipping your airplane around, shooting the airplane behind you, fighting with a big zeppelin. Uh, it was going to be like explosions everywhere and we thought, this is going to be cool. We know how to do explosions, it'll be fine. So as always, we decided, uh, decided to develop for PC and Steam. Um, how many of you have a game in development for PC? That's a pretty big part. How many of you for Steam? Oh good, good, no. Um, Steam is pretty cool. Uh, it's not really hard to develop for because you basically just develop the game for PC um, or Mac or Linux. Uh, you have pretty high freedom in how you develop the game, what tools you use, what frameworks you use. Um, so that's, it's, it's really nice. Working for Steam is really pleasant and the game went, like development for the game went really, really well. Um, and then one day when we had just started on uh, Lift Trousers, we got an email from a guy named Chahid and Shahid works for Sony Computer Entertainment Europe. Shahid is a pretty cool dude. Um, I actually asked if I could put his email address there. If you need a contact at PlayStation, that's a contact at PlayStation. Um, anyway, um, he sent us an email that he really liked our very first game that we had ever released, uh, Super Crate Box. And he was working on something that back in the day, uh, had the name PSS. Eventually that got renamed to PlayStation Mobile. And PlayStation Mobile was Sony's program to bring smaller indie games to PlayStation Vita because they needed games for PlayStation Vita. They thought indies could fill that void. So they said, you know what, we're just going to give indies the tools they need to make PlayStation Vita games. So he asked us if we could make Super Create Box for PlayStation Mobile. We said yes. And uh, we made Super Crate Box for PlayStation Mobile. It delayed Lift Rouse for a little bit. Um, but that was fine. And then it turned into 2013. Uh, this was the build we had in 2013. You could see that it was already pretty uh, over the top. There's some explosions. Some missiles. Here's more explosions. Boom. Nice. Um, at this point, we were going to release Lift Rousers in spring. 2013. Spring 2013 at this point was about four months out. So we kept working on it and um, at that point we decided that since, um, since the PC version was coming along really well but the tools we were working in at that point it was Game Maker 8 weren't really all that powerful, we decided to uh, redo the game in C++. Uh, we used a framework called uh, Superfast Media Library. Um, and we had a custom engine built by a bunch of friends of ours. Um, the engine was called DAX. Uh, one big thing I want to point out, just because that's good for me, 
is that JW really wanted the clouds to look like those things, and I thought that was really ugly. So we argued about that for three days, uh, about the shape of the clouds. Like, we actually went to work and then fought about how the clouds should look in the game. Uh, and I won. So now the clouds look like that. And I'm still really proud of that. Um, but the good thing about using a custom engine for us was that the game was suddenly also uh, playable on Mac and Linux. Well, suddenly, of course, that's a lot of work. Um, and uh, the other cool thing was that if you look at under the waterline, so under the boats, fly back down, back down. Game Maker isn't really quite powerful enough. Game Maker 8 wasn't quite powerful enough to do this. But in the new build, we added reflections, which we also thought were really, really cool. So the game got m a lot better when we moved uh, from Game Maker 8, which wasn't that powerful, to a custom engine. So that was nice. Um, game Maker Studio is a lot more powerful. But that's a different story. But Game Maker 8 really had some issues. Um, the biggest issue with Game Maker 8 was that it didn't work on Windows 8, which was about to release, which was a big problem. Because if you make a video game that doesn't work on the latest computers, uh, consumers will hate you and not buy your video game. Uh, so don't do that. So we kept talking to, uh, to PlayStation. Shahid, uh, we released Super Create Box Mobile um, for PlayStation Vita, uh, and Shahid loved it. Uh, he thought it was the best thing ever made for PlayStation Vita. Uh, so he invited me to come visit him at Sony Computer Entertainment Europe in London. And um, we uh, sat in a little cafe and talked about um, this new game that we have, this Lift Trousers. And um, in the cafe, we signed the deal. Um, and the deal was going to be really, really simple. We would make an exclusivity deal with Sony. Um, and in exchange for that, they would do a whole lot of marketing, get us dev kits for free, um, and uh, make sure that the game would uh, be at the major events uh, around the world and that we would be there as well. So we thought, that's a pretty cool deal. Uh, they also said we'd get some money, so that was nice. Um, the one condition they had is they wanted to launch simultaneous with uh, PC, Mac, and Linux. And we said, fine, how hard can it be to make a PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita version of this game? Um, so we said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll announce simultaneously. And then on the blog, on our own blog, we also promised all of our fans that no worries, Lufthaus is, is slightly delayed to Q3 2013, while we make sure that the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita build are being made, but you will be able to play Lift Trousers on PC, on Mac, on Linux, on PlayStation 3, and PlayStation Vita on the exact same day. <sighs> that was cool, that was cool, but it was a bad idea. Let's talk about developing games for PlayStation. So, when we decided to add PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita, the first thing we did is we went back to our, um, to our engine and started looking at how much work it was going to be. This was the first time we had access to the documentation for PlayStation. This was the first time we had access to the dev kits so we could play around. We decided it was going to take about two months of development at best to get everything working flawlessly. So we decided to delay Lift Houses. Instead of spring, we were going to hit summer. About three months delay, that should be more than enough, right? Um, now, suddenly, instead of three platforms, we were developing for five platforms. And that was a bit more work than we thought. And on top of that, the two new platforms were very, very different from the original platforms. PC, Mac, and Linux all are very similar in the way they input. They're very similar in how they interface with their graphics. The PS3, the PS Vita, very, very different. PlayStation Vita, even though I love the device, has the oddest screen aspect ratio you'll ever see on a device, except for that one Android phone that has a diagonal screen for some reason. But Android is weird. Um, be careful with Android as well. But let's talk about the Vita. Uh, the aspect ratio for the Vita is like completely ridiculous. It's like four times as wide as it should be. Um, and it meant that Luftrausers, which was developed for PC, actually didn't really work on Vita. What ended up happening is if we scaled lift trousers up, just three quarter of the screen was gone and players couldn't really see what was happening above and below them. 
So we had to redo a lot of the code, and since um, a lot of our code is quite hacky, uh, it turned out that if we just made the screen wider instead, there were a lot of artifacts because we would just remove airplanes and like make them turn around and like so that the action would stay tight. You know, if an airplane flies off the screen on the left, we didn't take keep track of the airplane. We just said like, okay, you're off the screen, disappear, and in two seconds just come back. But when we made the screen wider, all of that started happening inside the screen. So that wasn't good. So we had to like rethink all that. But then when we made the screen wider, the timings were all wrong. So we had to rebalance the game for Vita as well so that it would feel the same as it did on PC. So there was all that. And then on top of that, we made a game to be played with arrows and a button. That's very different from an analog stick. And at first we said, you know what? We're going to use the D-pad. And then it turns out that if you give people a PlayStation Vita game that, only is, that you can only control with the D-pad, people just think the analog stick is broken. So that didn't work either. So suddenly we had to make sure that the game worked on an analog stick as well. We had to make sure that the, game, the buttons worked. We had like a really weird thing where on the PC version, up is accelerate and left and right is rotate and space is shooting, which kind of works. The problem is that you need to be able to, um, to shoot and accelerate at once. And if you use the analog stick for acceleration, so up is accelerate, it becomes really hard to turn. But if you put it on a button, you have to press two buttons at once to shoot and fly. So you had to play with the triggers as well, and like after like three weeks, four weeks of tweaking, we had really, really solid controls on PlayStation Vita. But it also cost us four weeks. So about three months later, by the time we were ready for, uh, we should have been ready for our release, Q3 2013, we went to certification. How many of you have ever done cert for a console platform? One person. Do you like it? Nice. Um, let's talk about certification. How many of you do know what certification is? Okay. For those of you that do not know, if you release a game on PC and it's really, really broken and buggy, Steam doesn't give a shit. They're just like, okay, release your game, consumers will hate it, nobody will buy it, you're a loss. And that's what Steam does, right? Now, if you do that on PlayStation, or you try that on Wii, you try it on Microsoft, that's not how it goes. Before you release your game, you get a, basically like a book that is full of rules, and you need to keep to those rules pretty much exactly. You can negotiate some of the rules, some of the rules are optional, but there's really silly rules in there. There's rules about how much of the screen you can use for your HUD on the PlayStation 3. There's rules about that there needs to be a start screen in a console game. If you ever wondered why every game still does that thing where you have to do like press start, it's because they have to. Why? Because they say so. And there's a lot of them. There's rules about whether you can call a button a button or not. Like, is this called a button or not? Is this called a trigger? Do you want to call it something else? Bad luck for you. Um, in fact, some of the certification things we ran into were really, 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 really strange. Um, for example, in the, uh, for those of you that, uh, that know lift trousers, you know that it looks like this, right? So how many colors do you think are in our full palette? It's seven. This game uses seven colors. We submitted it to PlayStation. We got two really funny um, reports back. One of them was um, the screen shakes violently when explosions happen. And we thought, yes, it does. That's not a bug. We like that. Um, and the other one was that in, the, in our interface prompts, we made the little PlayStation buttons in those seven colors. Because we're not going to add like a blue X and a green triangle. We're going to make them brown like the rest of the game. So it turns out that, um, let's see, graphic or photo images of PlayStation 3, PlayStation PS1, PlayStation 2, PSP, PlayStation Vita, or SCE peripherals are displayed according to the latest product image guideline. Basically means no. It needs to be purple, and it needs to be green, and the circle needs to be red, and that's just the way you have to do it. 
So we sent them an email and we told them that we were not going to add hundreds of colors to our game just because they wanted their shitty buttons to have a certain color. And they told us that we could uh, appeal. So we went into a formal process, we sent them an email, we asked them formally if we could waive that requirement and after three and a half weeks we got an email back that if we could make a really good case for it, that it would be fine. So we argued that our game has seven colors and we're not going to add more colors to it. And they said, okay. So that cost us three and a half weeks. And then this list is basically a whole bunch of stuff that cost us a lot of time. Did we, like we didn't know that if you press the uh, PlayStation button on a console that the game itself has to pause itself. We thought the PlayStation did that. The PlayStation doesn't do that. Xbox doesn't do that either. A lot of consoles didn't do that. We were suddenly stuck with like hundreds of things that we didn't know about that we just had to fix. The problem with that, the secondary problem with that is that the process for, um, for um, technical requirements are also kind of ridiculous. These systems were built for AAA development. It's really cool. What is she saying? Oh. It's a train station over there in the main hall. I'm ahead of schedule, I can give it a second. Можете прикрыть дверь, наверное, входящую, чтобы не было входящего звука. Is it exciting? No. Okay. Anyway, we got this list of like a hundred things that we didn't know about. And uh, we said, eh, there are a hundred tiny things, we can fix this. So instead of Q3, we were going to launch Q4. And now instead of Q4, we said maybe instead of Q4, it'll be like Q1 of 2014. And by this time, most of our team had actually moved on to the next project because we didn't need an artist anymore. Like he just needed to recolor the buttons if Sony said no. We didn't need a musician anymore because all the music was done. So basically we greenlit a new project, JW and Paul, our artist, and Yukio, our musician, all of them moved on to the next project and I stayed alone with one other programmer to finish this game. A hundred tiny things. Can't be that hard, right? Um, in the meanwhile, there were some other problems. Ridiculous Fishing, our fishing game was pretty much done. So I had to launch that as well. Um, so I had to finish Luftrausers, launch Luftrausers and launch Ridiculous Fishing. I decided that that was a bit much. So I reached out to a bunch of old friends of ours, a publisher named Devolver Digital. And um, we told them, hey, we have this airplane game and basically you just, we need you to just do the marketing and not anything else. Like that's it. We'll pay you a little bit and then you do the marketing for us. So we made a little deal and they made sure that uh, we could focus on the development of Luftrausers while they did the marketing. So that worked out really well. And then it was 2014. The game was looking better and better. There was explosions. <sighs> we ended up being stuck in certification hell for almost a year. A large part of that is Sony. A large part of that is just the way these systems work. A large part of that is that we had no idea what the hell we were doing. A large part of that was that the way this system works is actually really, really poorly designed. Basically what you do is you send a build of your game and they start looking for things that break certification. Okay? If they find a number of bugs that you have to fix, they just stop checking the game. They're just like, eh, it's broken. And then they send it back and then you go, okay, I'll fix these three things. And then you send it back to them, but there's a delay. You can't just immediately submit it back. You have to wait for an amount of time. So after an amount of time, you send it back and then they check it again. And then they find three more things. And they're like, eh, it's broken. You're like, yeah, yeah, but could you just check the whole game? and then send us one big list of things, they're like, no, 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 no. If you can't even get these things right, we're not going to check the full game. We're like, listen, okay, just 
the fact that if the game closes, it just it still does like one single call is not a good reason to just say like, hey, we're not going to check the rest of. They're like, no, listen, this is the way the system works. This is how it's going to be. So every time we fixed a bunch of stuff, we had to send it away. We had to wait for a while until the game got back, then fix three more things, send it back, wait for a few weeks until the build got back, send it back, and keep doing that. We weren't good at this. We had no idea. Did we know what half of the things on that paper meant? Like, what, what, does, that, what does all of this mean? Like, line drawings and newly created illustrations? There were no, like, what, we had airplanes and pixels. Like, we didn't have line drawings, but for some reason we still broke this rule. This is the list of rules we broke. It's a lot of them. And then ironically, one of my favorite things is that this one down there says that all the trophies can be unlocked by gameplay. We got that, we got that one back like four or five times and we were pretty sure that you could unlock all the trophies because we did that all the time. So we tried to fix it and then they said, hey, it's fixed now. And we were like, cool. And it turned out that the fix we did actually broke it. So the PlayStation Vita version of Lufthouse is right now, you can't unlock all the trophies. Even though it did cost us almost a month and a half to pass this test by somehow breaking it. So all of this is very strange and it's very opaque and you don't really know what's happening. You just send your game and you just pray that it works out and then it doesn't. Because certification is a pain. And then it would have been okay if that was the only thing. On top of certification, there's also all the other bureaucracy. Did you know that Sony is not one company? Sony is a lot of companies. Sony Europe is a different company from Sony America, which is a different company from Sony Japan. You want to know the funnest things? All of them share this list of requirements. So this technical requirement checklist is the same for those companies. But they interpret the rules differently. So you can fill for one rule in Sony America, but be okay in Sony Europe, or vice versa, which was also really fun. On top of that, you have to get your ratings done. You have to make sure that your game has like age ratings, stuff like that. Uh, you have to fill out tons of paperwork. Anytime you run into a bug with their SDK or with their software, you have to file a ticket that takes a while to get back to. And this is not just like, don't get me wrong, this is not just PlayStation. Like Microsoft has the same issues, Nintendo is also kind of ridiculous. Like all of them are a pain. And the reason for that is obviously because they were never made for indie developers. These were made for big indie studios, uh, big, so, well, big AAA studios where the solution to certification is annoying is we hire 30 more people so that we can get all of this out of the way. If you're an indie developer and you are both the developer and the person doing the paperwork and the person doing the contact with Sony, it means your little airplane game can be delayed by a year. Which is what happened. And remember that little promise we made? Lift Trousers is gonna be playable on the exact same day on PC, Mac, Linux, PlayStation 3 and Vita. We had a fully working, ready to release build of Luft trousers for PC, Mac and Linux that we sat on for a year. Literally nothing changed about the game in that year. It was the exact same game that eventually launched in March uh, 2018 that we had in March 2013. The only thing that had changed is that we fixed a hundred fucking rules on PlayStation. Now, when we finally released, it wasn't half bad. Luft trousers did really well, it got great scores on Metacritic, it sold really well. Um, and actually, we got offered a deal by PlayStation to um, a PlayStation Plus deal where the game would be free on launch and they would just give us a big bag of money. And we thought about that and then we said no. Because even though we like the idea of a big bag of money, we also like the idea of people having to pay for our video games. Um, so we started with that and then we said, but you know what, if, we, if you want to do that deal in like six months or something, if you give us a big bag of money, in six months the game can be free, that's fine. Um, so uh, we took that deal, they gave us a smaller bag of money, but it was still a bag of money. Um, and when the game launched, it actually earned back all of our investment in two days. So the game came out and all of the money we spent was back in two days, which was awesome. 
Um, and then every day after that was profit, which is even better. Um, a very interesting thing is, uh, we didn't expect that, but can you guess which the best selling platform was? PC. Whoever said PC got it right. PC Steam is by far the best selling one. Uh, can you guess what the second one is? Vita. It's PlayStation Vita. Uh, the Vita version of Luftrausers did amazingly well. It turns out that the Vita is a great gaming system. The people that own Vitas are pretty intense gamers. And uh, that if they finally get a video game that they can play, that they will buy it. Um, so that was great for us. Um, and people always say like, one of the things that I keep hearing is that console is not a really good place to try and earn money. Well, A, very clearly, uh, Lufthouse has made us good money on PlayStation Vita. Um, but it is really, really, it's a really strange platform. The investment is really, really high uh, on any console because of all of the rules we talked about before. Um, and the user base isn't quite as big as it could be on PC. So you'd say it's a really bad idea to launch on console. Uh, the truth is that there are um, three good reasons to release on, to try and release on console anyway. One is you might make money. That's not a very good reason. Number two is launching on console for some reason gives you way more legitimacy than any release on PC. If you tell anybody out, like, out somewhere, hey, we made a game for Steam, they go like, you made a what? For what? If you say, we made a game for PlayStation, they're like, oh, PlayStation. I've heard of that. For some reason, and this is big, this is an important thing, if you make a game for console, you look a lot more serious as a game developer. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's a good thing, but it's the way it is. The other thing is, one of the interesting things we learned later is if you don't release at the same time with all of your platforms, it's a really good way of extending your product life. You make a game, you release it on PC. Then, two months later, you release it on PlayStation. There's news. Then, two months later, you release it on Platform X. There's news about your game. Every time there's news about your game, your Steam sales, they peak. Every time you release a new version of your game, all the sales on the previous platforms that it's available on peak because there's news about the game. So, um, and a, a British developer, Mike Biddle, actually played this perfectly because he is still releasing his original game from 2011, Thomas Was Alone, uh, on new platforms, like every few months. Like, I get bored of it by now. If I see Thomas Was Alone in the news, I'm like, oh God, what is he releasing it on now? And like, the one time it's iPad, and then it's like Nvidia Shield or something, and it's like, I haven't even heard of this device, but sure, like, release it on that as well. Um, so, there is a really good argument there that it's really good to support your existing product, if bringing it to console isn't a major, major pain, uh, which it can be. Um, if you do want to develop on console, one of the best tips I can give you is reach out to a developer you know that has done it and just sit down with them and talk about it. Um, somewhere between their tears of despair and their stories, you will get the tips you need uh, to develop a game for console. Um, the final thing, um, I don't know what the presence of the uh, major companies of, of Microsoft and Nintendo and Sony are here in the region. Um, it's a good idea to figure that out. Uh, a lot of the uh, console manufacturers actually are pretty desperate for content. Um, so if you go to them, talk about your game, pitch them your game, sometimes they'll just send you some dev kits for free and you can give it a go. And sometimes they're actually super great to work with. In fact, our collaboration with Sony on lifter officers, besides the certification issues, was so good that we immediately decided to sign on our new game, Nuclear Throne. So, making games for console. Be wary, but go for it. Questions? Thank you, Rami. Задавайте вопросы. Не вижу рук. Рук вижу. Two questions. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, you talk a lot about the PlayStation Vita, but um, is there was any specific challenges on the PlayStation 3? 
Specific challenges on the PlayStation. Where, where, does this, where does this question come from? Oh, there. Hi. Sorry. I was looking there for some reason. Um, so do we have any specific challenges on PlayStation? On PlayStation 3? Yeah, PlayStation 3 is a pain. Um, and th that is not even... That is not even, well, it is Sony's fault, but like, it's not something they could do anything about. The hardware architecture for PlayStation 3 was very, very odd. Uh, like, very, very odd. Like, I don't know why anybody ever thought that was a good idea odd. Um, and while, like, Vita is kind of strange as well, at least, like, it had, it had, like, touching points. The PlayStation 3 stuff, most of our bugs and, like, code errors happened there, and it wasn't a very pleasant experience to develop for it. Um, strangely enough, the PlayStation 4 is awesome. Like, developing for PlayStation 4 is absolutely amazing, but... Yeah, PlayStation 4 is effectively a PC. One of the, one of the most annoying... One of my favorite things that changed about PlayStation 4 versus PlayStation 3 is in PlayStation 3 you still had your title save region on the screen, and that was very annoying. It's like, you have, like, title save region is like, if you make a game, like, the inner 80% of the screen is where your HUD can go, and like the outer 10% on each side, you're not allowed to put any, any information that is critical to gameplay. Because if you have different aspect ratios of TVs, those parts could get cut off. So they just say like, don't put anything there. Um, on PlayStation 4, you basically, the user has to like, use this little interface thing where they say how big their TV is and then the PlayStation sort of handles that, which is nicer. Uh, you can kind of get away from that rule nowadays. I, it's not that I hate title save region, it's just that I think it's ugly. Uh, so I was happy with that. But PlayStation 4 is a lot more pleasant to develop for. And PlayStation Vita wasn't half bad. Like, it's, the PlayStation 4 is weaker than you think, graphically. Um, but it can do awesome things, so I was like, cool. Yeah, I like, I like the Vita a lot more than the PS3. Questions here? <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for the great speech. Uh, the question is, your game Super Great Box was made in Game Maker Studio? Uh, uh, in Game Maker 7. Game Maker 7. Yes. Uh, did you use Game Maker Studio for development? And what can you say about developing in Game Maker Studio for the um, consoles? So, Super Great Box for uh, PC was made in Game Maker 7. Super Great Box for Mac was made in Game Maker 7 for Mac. Game make, uh, Super Crate Box iOS was made in Objective C. Super Crate Box for PlayStation Mobile was a C++ port. Um, and the fixed version of Super Crate Box that we'll be releasing sometime in the future is made in Game Maker Studio. Um, because it's pretty broken now. Um, Game Maker Studio and console is amazing. Uh, it's it's like I know Unity's like integration with um, with consoles is great. I personally, from what I've seen, the Game Maker integration is even better. Uh, like getting the game to run on PlayStation 4 took us 30 seconds to get it to run, and then like two days to fix everything, and then like a few like a week and a half to get our interface up to speed. Um, on Microsoft uh, Xbox One, it ran immediately. I know they have test builds for other consoles and products. It's like, it, it was amazing. Uh, Game Maker Studio, um, their exports to most major platforms are great. Uh, iOS and Android are like hit or miss depending on whether you kept track of how you're designing, but it, it works perfectly. Oh, there. Hello, my name Hi. is Alex. I wonder what your marketing consists of. Do you do it yourselves or and like press versus YouTubers? Maybe YouTubers already know you. Like, what, which works better for you? Is it okay if I sit? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so, oh, this is nice. Um, so marketing in our case, um, I usually do the marketing for our games. Uh, I've done the marketing on all of our games except for Lift Your Houses and Serious Sam. Uh, Serious Sam because it's not our IP. And uh, Lift Your Houses because I was too busy. Uh, for me, marketing is kind of a mix of everything, right? You're basically, it's awareness building. I don't, like a lot of people think of marketing as trying to convince people your game is good. Uh, and I think that's a weird way of looking at marketing. I think of marketing as trying to reach people that already think your game is good, um, that just haven't heard about it, right? 
Um, so for me, it's just how much attention can I get? And like, I have a bunch of like weird rules for myself. I want like each of our games to have like a major news story every month, uh, and I'll work to make that happen. Uh, I reach out to major websites. Uh, we work really closely with Twitch and YouTubers uh, because they're super fun. Uh, for Nuclear Throne, for example, uh, there's like four or five Twitch streamers and YouTubers that started streaming Nuclear Throne really, really early, but nobody had ever heard of them. And then we promoted the hell out of them uh, just so they got more popular. And now like some of them are way bigger than, than we are in terms of reach. Uh, which is awesome because they still play Nuclear Throne, uh, even though now they also play like Binding of Isaac and other games. But like that sort of stuff is great. Like I think for us, marketing is very much a community thing. You just build a really strong community and make sure that people hear about the game, and then you're good. Um, then you're good is sort of a like overstatement. But like if you can get to the point where people talk about your game without you having to ask them to do that, you're in a good spot. Um, we have the additional benefit of our games being very explosive, arcadey, f weird games about fish hitting things with guitars and shooting fish with machine guns. So people talk about our games on their own. But like, depending on what your game is, you want to think you want to think of your marketing as an extension of your game design. So if your game is like a dark, dreary game, have like a marketing campaign that fits that. Like nothing is weirder than having like an atmosphere. Like there was a game in somewhere in Europe, I forgot where I was, uh, which was a really atmospheric, like, sort of like the room meets Gone Home, you know? And it was like a very, it was like a very dark, broody, like, sort of like scary, not quite a horror game. And then their launch trailer looked like a Call of Duty trailer. Uh, like, listen, that's not gonna sell your game. And even if it does sell your game, everybody that's going to play your game is going to hate it because they expect Call of Duty and they get to like walk, like walk around the house and solve puzzle game. Um, so marketing is sort of a weird art, um, but it's fun. Like it just takes time. Good. Uh, hi, Rami. Hi. My name is Vladimir, and thank you for a talk on your games. I had uh, two real short questions. Uh, first of all, uh, which engine uh, do you use for develop Nucleotron? And the second, uh, when you finish posting those updates for Nucleotron, because I think that game is already brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so Nucleotron is being created in GameX Studio, which uh, is the same tool that we used when we uh, started on Nucleotron. Um, so for those who don't know Nucleotron, it's a top-down action game, and one of the ideas that we had with it is that every week we would release an update in early access. So every single Saturday, we post a new version of the game for players to play. And every Tuesday and every Thursday, we live stream our development on Twitch. So people can just see us make the game. Uh, we've done that for 72 weeks now, which is quite a lot. And we intend to keep doing that until a few weeks before launch. Uh, at this point, and we've become very, very wary about mentioning launch dates after lift trousers, because apparently you can miss them by two years. Um, we think we'll be done by like Q3 of this year. So there's like 20-ish updates left probably. Uh, if we can hit like update 100 and launch there, that will be kind of awesome. But like we don't know. It's like Nuclear Throne is very, uh, since it's an early access game, like the development is very community driven. It's like what they talk about, we look at. Um, and we're starting to get to that point where like, okay, we've got everything and now we just need to wrap it up. And we feel that it will take three months, but if the community suddenly starts talking about like, we want X, we might have to do that too. So it's like, we don't know. Hopefully not too long anymore. We're not a studio that was, me and JW, the two of us at Vlambeer, we are not people that were meant to work on a project for two years. We were meant to make like 20 games in like two years. Like just like, here's a weird idea, let's make it. Here's something strange, let's do it. And these long projects, even though they're a lot of fun, they're also really, really tiring. So we, we really want to do weird, silly games for a while after this one. And the last question is here. Here. That's so good. Uh, hi, Rene. Yeah, I just have like an, a voice. Oh, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Rene. My name is Alexander, and I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, uh, I want to ask about uh, ridiculous fishing. You say your idea was stolen and your game was stolen. Uh, but don't you think that 
every developer could uh, use the same ideas and idea without realization costs nothing. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, yes, I absolutely. Question and uh, oh. a second, sorry. Second uh, question. This yeah. is a great last question. Yeah. Go. Yes, two, two last questions. Uh, and the second question, uh, would you recommend um, to start work with platforms like PlayStation for indie studios? For indie studios, yeah, okay. I, I, um, if this is the first game for indie studios, or maybe the second yeah. game. So, the first one is a, is a question I thought about a lot, um, because obviously Ridiculous Fishing is a game about shooting fish. Like, that is a strange idea, and it's a pretty unique idea, but it's not an idea that should remain unique, right? I think the problem with uh, Ridiculous Fishing for us was if you're working on a game and you're communicating about it and somebody else sees that game and basically copies the entire design down to the upgrade names, then that is not inspiration. I think there is a line between inspiration and cloning. I think that it's important in the industry that we share ideas and that we share our progress so that nobody can say like, hey, I invented the jump. You can't use the jump in your game, right? Like, we don't want that situation. But what we do want is that if somebody tries something risky and something creative and takes all the time to come up with an idea that is interesting and strange and new, that they should be able to finish their game and release it um, without having to worry about like somebody else being like, hey, that's cool, uh, here, we'll pay this studio X amount of money and then we release it first. Now, the reality, of course, is that that is good business. Like, people that steal those ideas, they're just really savvy business people. It's just like, sure, that's true and that's cool and all. It's not the industry I want to be a part of, I guess. Like, the industry I want to be a part of celebrates creativity and it celebrates unique ideas. And I think with Ridiculous Fishing, we ended up proving that being creative pays off. Because Ninja Fishing, the clone, ended up making uh, a few, like a million dollars. Ridiculous Fishing ended up winning every major iOS award like in that year. It won Game of the Year, it won the Apple Design Award. It was featured in dozens of magazines. It landed us on like top lists for the year. And it actually ended up out earning the clone as well. Um, so in the end, creativity did win. But I worry that, you know, developers work on something really creative that have their stuff stolen, that they leave this industry. Because it is really depressing when that happens. And I want to make sure that they know that that's shit when somebody steals your game and that we should not just accept that as, hey, that's part of it. Um, as for your second question, um, if you want to get started with developing for console, um, does it, can, can anybody, is anybody from the region here that works with Sony? Which Sony territory is this? Europe, ski? All right, so there's, there's, two, there's two main tips I have. Sony Europe is pretty good with dev kits, so find a contact. In my presentation, there was a contact email address. If you wanted to work on Sony, and you didn't, if you wanted to work with Sony and you didn't write that down, you messed up. And you messed up good because that was a contact address. The good news is most of the Sony folks are really cool and are on Twitter. Um, so if you have Twitter, just search for the Sony people and they are there. Just send them a message on Twitter and they usually do get back to you. They're kind of swamped because a lot of people reach out to them. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, if you have a Sony contact, and this is my preferred method, if you have a Sony contact and you're pretty confident about your game, ask if you can meet them uh, either at your studio or in London. Um, it's, like, it's like a three hour flight from here to London, I guess, three and a half maybe. Um, and they are like 30 minutes away from the airport. So if you can manage to get yourself to London, if you have the funds to do that, um, then that is a really good way of making them take you serious because you are spending money on this as well. And that's a, that's a good sign. So. That's how I would do it, I guess. Send them an email, see what happens. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramin.